You will recall that the years between 1789 and 1815 had been unsettling at best for most of Europe and for most European rulers in particular. The ideas of liberty and equality, neither of which sounded very appealing to the old regimes, took hold of France and led to both regicide and a bloody revolution. To make matters worse, outsiders tried to intervene in France, but to no avail. And as if the French Revolution and the warmongering directory weren't bad enough, the ambitious Napoleon Bonaparte marched his enemies anywhere he pleased, despite the best efforts of the rest of Europe. Now, after the Quadruple Alliance, which included Britain, Austria, Russia, and Prussia, finally defeated Napoleon not once but twice, it seemed as though Europe might actually have some time to catch its collective breath. In one way or another, France had been stirring things up for some time, and the four victorious nations, with some other minor nations riding their coattails, were determined to make sure France didn't cause problems again. This idea of maintaining a delicate balance actually came from Renaissance Italy. Now, Renaissance Italy was a geographic region with a number of independent principalities, and I have a map here for you. They saw year after year of infighting and violent competition among the Italian states. Not until Italy adopted a system known as balance of power politics did the warring subside. Uh, the Italian states created a system of alliances and mutual agreements whereby the majority of the states would keep those individual states in check in the case that any one state rose up and threatened the peace of the region. After the turmoil of the French Revolution and Napoleon, the leaders of the predominant European powers decided it would be best for all of them to adopt a system like that of Renaissance Italy. They wanted to prevent the same thing from happening in Europe again. Now, although their main goal was to keep France in check, the nations wanted a system that would prevent other nations from doing what France had done. Europe was tired of fighting, and with the promise of economic improvement as a result of the Industrial Revolution, Europe hoped for decades of peace and prosperity. With that in mind, the European powers set out to design a roadmap for continental peace. The Bourbon dynasty was restored. You see, with Napoleon securely exiled, or so they thought at the time, the victorious European nations of Austria, Russia, Prussia, and Great Britain decided it would be in the best interest of France and, frankly, in the best interests of the other European monarchies to reinstate the French monarchy. Now, Louis XVI died during the Revolution, and his son, Louis XVII, died in prison in 1795. Therefore, the throne passed to Louis XVIII, who was actually the brother of Louis XVI. King Louis XVIII was an unattractive choice for a king on many different levels. Uh, first off, he was old, and he was in poor health. He had little zeal for anything, and he appealed to very few people. Upon the restoration of the monarchy in France, many of the émigré, the, noble the nobles who fled the revolution, they returned to France with lists of demands. Likewise, many revolutionaries demanded a return to revolutionary ideals. In a show of good faith, Louis XVIII returned the government to a sort of constitutional monarchy, um, it had a bicameral legislature that included the Chamber of Peers and the Chamber of Deputies. Despite having this bicameral legislature, his government was really weak, and that's putting it at, at its best. The word of his weak government got to Napoleon, and that's what prompted him to return, um, during which... King Louis XVIII fled the country to Ghent because he feared for his life. 
upon Napoleon's second defeat and subsequent exile, this time for good. Louis XVIII returned to the throne, and he ruled there for about a decade longer. Upon Louis's death, the throne passed to his brother, who ruled as Charles X. After Louis's restoration, violence had broken out against those suspected of supporting either the revolution or Napoleon. The violence resembled that of the Reign of Terror, and it was generally referred to as the White Terror. Louis didn't support or approve the violence, but he was powerless to stop it. The victorious allies initially had decided to deal lightly with France because, after all, the nation had been oppressed by a dictator, so they were kind of sensitive about what was going on. But after seeing the way the French people and soldiers rallied behind Napoleon upon his return to the nation he had supposedly oppressed, the allied nations decided not to go so easy on France after all. They had no sympathy. So the leaders of the Quadruple Alliance decided that the best way to reestablish order was to hold a congress or a meeting of representatives to decide the future of Europe. This meeting was to be held in Vienna in 1814 and 1815. Furthermore, they agreed to hold similar congresses every few years to maintain the order they had established. This system of congresses referred, is referred to as the Concert of Europe, and it helped to maintain relative peace for another generation, and it helped prevent another continental war for about a century. Now, in addition to dealing with France and establishing a system of balance of power politics to keep the peace, the Congress of Vienna had the daunting task of deciding exactly what to do with all the states whose rulers had been unseated and whose borders had changed as a result of revolutionary and Napoleonic expansion. Too much had changed in Europe for the Congress to say, as you were, <laughs> it's really difficult to do that. Um, they couldn't return every state on the continent to the way it was in 1789. Parts of Europe altered by Napoleon included Poland, the Netherlands, Saxony, and other German states, as well as various parts of Italy. The Congress did, however, return France to its 1789 borders. So here is the map of Europe after the Congress of Vienna. Now, the states represented at the Congress of, v of Vienna included Austria, Russia, Prussia, Great Britain, and France. Everyone present had to agree on the terms, even the big loser, which was France. The leading negotiator of the Congress was Prince Clemens von Metternich of Austria. Britain's Prime Minister, Robert Castlereagh, also played a major role in the negotiations. Charles Talleyrand, if you remember, he was one of the conspirators in the coup with Napoleon. He represented France and Karl von Hardenberg represented Prussia. And finally, Count Karl Robert Nesselrode officially represented Russia, although Tsar Alexander did much of the negotiating. Everyone agreed on a few major issues. Um, the first, France had been bothering the rest of Europe since 1789, and if you wanted to get technical, probably since the reign of Louis XIV. Nothing in its recent history suggested that France would behave unless something were done. Second, everyone agreed that to the victors should go the spoils for all the time, effort, money, and lives wasted on the conflict with France. Third, everyone agreed that no single state should be rewarded so greatly as to upset the balance of power the Congress was so desperately trying to establish. Finally, all the states of Europe were to be secure, stable states with permanent borders, states not likely to be preyed upon by other more powerful ones. Because of the brief return of Napoleon and a major disagreement over the settlement, 
the Congress almost failed to accomplish its goals. In addition to returning France to its 1789 geographic size and restoring the French monarchy, the Congress forced France to pay a sizable remuneration. Furthermore, the Congress forced France to allow Allied troops to be stationed within French borders for five years, just in case. Those were the terms that everyone could agree upon, even Talleyrand. Britain retained many holdings it had gained over the years in its many battles with France. Austria ceded territory it had won from France in exchange for land in Venetia and Lombardy and along the Dalmatian coast of the Adriatic Sea. Compensating Russia and Prussia didn't go as smoothly. You see, Alexander wanted to reestablish the Kingdom of Poland, which would naturally be under Russian control. Prussia agreed to that idea provided it could have Saxony. Metternich and Castlereagh feared that if those two states acquired so much wealthy and populous land that this balance of power would be tipped in favor of not only Russia and Prussia, but also in favor of the region of Eastern Europe. The disagreement over this nearly led to more fighting. Um, the treaty allowed for war if it were necessary, but fortunately for Europe, cooler heads finally prevailed, and in the end, Prussia and Russia each took a smaller portion of the land that they had originally wanted. As for the other states around Europe, Belgium and Holland were combined to form the Kingdom of the Netherlands, a larger state capable of defending itself. The 300 plus German states were consolidated into 39 states, which formed a loosely united German confederation. Sweden received Norway from Finland. Spain and Portugal each got their old rulers back, whom Napoleon had knocked off their respective thrones, and the Pope was restored as the ruler of the Papal States in Italy. So clearly, the Congress of Vienna was a major turning point in 19th century Europe. Many contemporaries criticized the conservative measures taken by the Congress, arguing that the Congress repressed the sense of nationalism and liberalism that was beginning to blossom in parts of Europe. Considering that the negotiations were influenced by the most conservative Metternich, perhaps the contemporary critics were correct. But later on, many historians considered the work of the Congress to be a watershed because such broad, sweeping changes were instituted with the agreement of all involved. Here's a summary of what happened at the Congress of Vienna, a few of the things. Um, the decades following the Congress of Vienna saw a renewed intellectual movement. The themes of nationalism and liberalism didn't originate during the years after the Congress, but they began to receive a lot of attention. Intellectuals were intrigued by the ideas of how they affected people so much that they would take up arms and fight for them. The interest in these ideas and the open discussions about them kept the ideas of nationalism in the minds of everyone and fueled later revolutions against the efforts of the conservatives. In the upcoming chapters, we're going to look at the ideas of nationalism, conservatism, liberalism, and the differences because this is a very critical turning point in European history.